So let us um, start. So let me first say again that, uh, like I reminded you also in previous weeks, that we put these talks online. Um, Jan Lubitsky has now managed to make a, um, a special uh, kind of broadcast uh, website from the from YouTube, so where all the, the talks are on YouTube. So it's now much easier to um, to see the talks. And uh, so I, I just recommend you usually a couple of days after the talk, and the, the talk will be uh, viewable on, on YouTube. So. Today we have uh, as our speaker Raphael Caton. He's uh, from the INAF Observatorio Astronomico di Padova in Italy, um, and uh, he uh, obtained his PhD, uh, his, his degree in physics at uh, Rome University in 1979, and uh, worked at various places since, um, at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile, in um, uh, at the uh, Asiago Astronomical Observatory, and in 1984 he spent some time in Texas where he began uh, a, a collaboration with uh, Chris Sneedon on abundances in, the, in field metal core stars. And then uh, at the end of 1984 he moved to Rome uh, Astronomical Observatory, and finally he came back to Padua as an associate astronomer. And so since 1989 he is uh, now in Padua. And uh, in addition to the topics that he's going to talk about today, he's also involved in uh, extrasolar planet searches, uh, in particular Sphere and EPICS programs. So, but today um, he's going to talk about multiple stellar populations in globular clusters. So, let's welcome Buffett. Thank you very much. And, uh, Okay, I will speak about uh, this topic, which has became became very popular in the last year. Uh, there were meetings on multiple stellar population, both uh, at the IAU Assembly and uh, at the last uh, American Astronomical Society meeting. Uh, there will be another important meeting uh, uh, at the end of this month in Monteporto. So this is becoming. A real popular topic, and I will try to uh, explain you why we think it's uh, so interesting and is so the, the, the reason we can for this popularity. Uh, the uh, work that I will describe is uh, not uh, only mine; it's the work of uh, many people. Uh, many of them are my collaborators. Uh, list uh, is here, and. Uh, uh, I will try to make justice to all the work of all the people, but it will be absolutely impossible, and of course it will be uh, my point of view on the question, on this issue. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, my talk starts with the concept of single stellar populations. Uh, single stellar population is a very popular concept in astronomy, uh, it is used in a wide range of uh, fields, uh, for instance, to describe the stellar populations in galaxies. Uh, a single stellar population is a set of stars having the same age, uh, the same chemical composition, both in helium abundance, which is in astronomy is called uh, typically Y, and in metal abundance, which is still in uh, astronomy is called uh, often Z. And metals are all the, everything which is not uh, hydrogen and helium. And uh, this, this uh, single stellar population stars are distributed with different masses according to an initial mass function. And uh, well, sometimes you may include binaries in this concept, sometimes not. But essentially, the idea is that uh, this is described by a single isochrome in the color magnitude diagram. Color diagram is the fundamental diagram of astronomy. And uh, this tool of a single stellar population is very useful. Uh, maybe for, uh, for its use in extragalactic astronomy, but also because of its use in stellar evolution uh, uh, studies. Uh, stellar clusters, uh, as we see them in our galaxy, 
are usually considered good examples of single state of populations. Uh, what, what we can see in, a globular, in uh, uh, clusters, we see here uh, a color meningo diagram of the globular clusters uh, on the left part. On the right part, this is an interpretation of this diagram. And uh, the diagram here is usually considered what you see in a Zenizer uh, You see stars of different masses, the less massive stars are still on the main sequence, burning hydrogen at their center. Then you have evolved stars which are on the image of your branch, burning hydrogen in the shell because the hydrogen center has been exhausted. And then stars arrive at the tip of the giant branch where they have a degenerate core or helium core where you have a, a ignition of helium which happens as a flash because it's a degenerate core. The star then shift here in this region of the color memory diagram, which is called the horizontal branch because it, it looks horizontal in this diagram. And uh, this star here have a co uh, core helium burning stars, but the core the uh, helium at the, in the core exhaust at the end, and so the stars then begin to evolve in this part here of the clear diagram. And uh, this part is called asymptotic giant branch, and in this part of the diagram you see stars which are burning hydrogen and helium in shell. Then the stars aims also they are helium, then we go as a we kind of white dwarf and go in the other part this part of the color of the diagram, which is difficult to be observed to be. So this is typical diagram, you see stars of different masses, less massive stars are here. These are stars of which originally had more and more masses and up to here. And uh, this is uh, what you expect typically to see in, uh, as a single stellar population. But there is clear, even from this diagram here, that uh, the massive stellar clusters in our galaxy, the globular clusters, are not really single stellar populations. It should be obvious from here, this diagram already, because these stars on the horizontal branch here, uh, the position of the star in the horizontal branch should be fixed by their chemical composition and mass. So there should be practically a single point here. Why you see that the stars are distributed along the horizontal branch? Typically, they have different colors, a range of different colors, which means different temperature. Actually, means also different masses of the stars. And how, why the stars are spread over over this wide range, why they are not concentrated in a single part, is really telling you about the fact that there are multiple stellar populations in regular clusters. But this fact was not recognized until a short time ago. So why this fact is now since uh, I think 1950s or at least uh, the early 60s, it was uh, not recognized as a clear indication of multiple stellar population up to very recent epochs. However, at first glance you can see that you can think this as a as a single isochrome and so as a single stellar population. Uh, the concept of single stellar population has been very useful uh, in stellar evolution. Uh, it has allowed to define a number of things that uh, else would have been very difficult to, to understand. For me, for me, for example, the nature of the blue spectral stars, the inclusion of mass loss in stellar models, the explanation of the horizontal branch, why stars are exactly that bright and that of that color. Most aspects of the asymptotic giant planet evolution, the evolution of stars along the wide dwarf cooling sequence, and the transformation between theoretical and observational planes. So many, many reasons to think that the single stellar population is a very useful concept. So it should not be completely abandoned, it should be only considered with some care. And uh, the reason is that, uh, as often happens, uh, as many other approximations, uh, the fact that global uh, clusters, massive stellar clusters, are uh, representative of single stellar population fails when subject to closer scrutiny. Only at the first phase they look like a single stellar population, but if you examine them in detail, you discover that they are not a single stellar population. Uh, the, uh, in some sort, uh, this should be obvious because if you form uh, 100,000 stars, 1 million stars, you cannot expect that they are exactly one twin of the other. 
there should be some difference from one spectrum to the other, not simply of the difference in mass, there should be also some other difference. As you must assume that the material is extremely homogeneous from which this cluster forms. So in some sort, you some, some difference you can expect, also the edge gap is slightly different from one object to the other. You cannot expect that all the stars form exactly at the same moment. There should be some range in these quantities. But the departures uh, of uh, uh, massive star cluster, globular cluster, from single stellar population is much larger and significant than simply a small spread in the formation epoch on the old, or simple or small spread in the chemical composition due to the original homogeneities of the clouds that form the star. And uh, also, I will show that uh, galaxies cannot be reproduced by a suitable weight sum, weighted sum of one paragonal cluster because there is a population of stars in global cluster that is found only in global clusters, and not found elsewhere, or it is almost not found elsewhere. It's very rare elsewhere. However, uh, in, uh, the multiple population uh, scenario in global cluster provide information of how the clusters form and also, this, this is also a very important factor, on the relation that they have with the host galaxy. I will not have time to speak of all these details, but I will try to, to have you an idea of how, how things are going. Uh, what are the typical properties of a massive stellar cluster, a global cluster? Global cluster is the term astronomy used for a very massive stellar cluster. Well, the mass is of the order of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 solar masses. There are clusters that are smaller than this amount. They are typically not called global clusters, but rather open clusters. It is a different category of objects. And I will show you that this different category of objects is a different history. So there is not simply the difference in mass. It is a much more important difference between these two classes of objects. The uh, integrated luminosity, especially magnitude, is between minus 5 and minus 10. They are very compact objects with a core radius of the order of one parsec and the central density of the order of 10 to the 5 stars per cubic parsec. So there are much more uh, dense environment than the solar neighborhood, 10 to the 6 times more uh, stars per cubic parsec. The metallicity is typically low. Many of the globular clusters are metal poor, very metal poor. And uh, the age is typically old, at least for the globular cluster that we see in our galaxy. They are all old objects with ages larger than 10 giga year in our galaxy. Uh, in other clusters, in other galaxies, there might be younger globular clusters, but in our galaxy, there aren't young globular clusters. Uh, there are about 150 globular clusters in our galaxy. There are catalogs that uh, you may look for their characteristic. And uh, they belong to different galactic populations. Uh, but uh, to the area, to the thick disk, to the barge, but not to the thin disk. There is no globular cluster associated to the thin disk of our galaxy. The sun is one star, a star of the thin disk. Uh, about 1% of the yellow and 0.1% uh, of the thick disk parts are in globular cluster. Remember this number because I will come back at the end of that. Well, what are the evidence that uh, in globular clusters there are multiple stellar populations and not a single stellar population? Uh, well, the evidence came from uh, a lot of information now, both from spectroscopy of stars in globular cluster and from photometry of stars in globular cluster. In both cases, the first evidence are quite old. Uh, in from photometry, it's actually from the uh, 50s to 60s when we discovered that it was discovered that there is a second parameter affecting the morphology of the horizontal range, second parameter other than metallicity. And uh, in spectroscopy, it uh, also started from the 70s. But for a long time, all these things were not understood. Were not understood that they were meaning something really important. They were thought to be peculiarities of stars in globular cluster with no other clear implications. It was only from about 2000, 2001 in particular, on with the discovery that the sodium oxygen decoration, I will speak about it now, uh, happens also for studying the main sequence that spectroscopy, uh, was, the data from spectroscopy were considered a definitive uh, uh, demonstration that there are multiple populations in globular clusters. 
And uh, it was only uh, two, three years later when uh, multiple main sequence and subgiant branches were discovered in the global cluster that it was understood that also photometry was clearly implied that there are multiple stellar populations. Uh, well, uh, even spectroscopy, so I will focus on spectroscopy in my talk, but uh, photometry is, uh, I, I stress, is very important to understand the properties of stars in global cluster. However, uh, since I am spectroscopy, I speak more about uh, the evidence of spectroscopy. The evidence, the first evidence of uh, uh, inhomogeneities in the chemical composition of stars in the cluster came from uh, the variation in strength of CH and CN made in uh, 1971. This is, say, for the peculiar case of omega 7, which I will come back later. Uh, um, this was discovered in the 70s, and in various studies it was shown that uh, carbon and nitrogen abundances are undercorrelated, and the strength of uh, the carbon, the CN bands, are often distributed in a bimodal way in globular cluster. Uh, originally, this discovery was made for the giant branch stars, because these stars are brighter and easier to observe, but later it was discovered that also uh, similar uh, the homogeneities also uh, are present among main single stars. For instance, there was a work by Riley et al. on 47 TAC that demonstrated that there is uh, some anti-correlation between CH and CN and bands in the, also in the main single stars of 47 TAC. These are stars that are very similar to each other from the position in the color of the diet, but a very different strength of the, uh, of the bands of these elements. CN, uh, carbon and uh, nitrogen are actually affected by the CNO cycle. Uh, the, if you, the temperature uh, at which this cycle may uh, happen so is very variable, but uh, CN analysis are affected also at relatively low temperature of uh, say 10 uh, to 20 million Kelvin. This temperature is reached at the end of the main sequence, the core. It is actually very difficult to, to mix a star, the core of the star with the exterior of the star. Uh, actually, it doesn't happen. It would cause a lot of strange things. But uh, uh, for a long time, it was thought that uh, some mixing, the same strange case of mixing, happens in global cluster stars. And uh, this may in particular happen along the region, the region of the uh, A few years later, uh, the group in uh, led by Bob Kraft and Chris Lidl, uh, found that uh, the, there is a widespread anticorrelation in the abundances of oxygen and sodium in uh, uh, global plastic. Uh, this is uh, much more difficult to explain with uh, uh, strange mixing effect. And this is, I uh, will show you, is the real, real cut observation that. Uh, uh, there cannot be simply a strange mixing which occurs in stars in globular clusters. By the way, these uh, things happen only for the globular cluster stars, as I will show you. A big step forward to understand the oxygen sodium anticorrelation was the acknowledgement that uh, uh, the, at the temperature where we have complete CNO cycle, and so you may transform oxygen into nitrogen, essentially because uh, in equilibrium. Uh, the equilibrium composition of the CNO cycle, uh, trans um, almost everything in the CNO is nitrogen, and uh, because this is due to the lifetime of nitrogen 14 bounding into something else, which is much longer than uh, for the other two uh, elements. So essentially, the, the CNO cycle, uh, you, you may transform original oxygen into nitrogen. And uh, so you may expect to deplete the abundance of oxygen. And this happens at temperature of the order of 30 to 50 million Kelvin, something like that, which is too hot for the main sequence. Uh, to this temperature, you have also proton capture on neon 22 to produce sodium 23. And since neon 22 is much more abundant than sodium 23, you may have a raise in the abundance of the sodium 23, which is clearly detectable. And so you have high sodium and low oxygen at this. If you have material which is burned at this temperature, if you are serving this material, you will find it to have high sodium abundances and low oxygen abundances. 
And uh, this is the explanation that we have for the oxygen solar anticoagulation. And uh, if you raise a little bit of temperature, you may have activation also of uh, uh, protocol capture of uh, magnesium 26 to produce aluminum 27. Uh, since again, magnesium will be much more abundant than aluminum, you may have uh, an anti-correlation between magnesium and aluminum too. And this is also observed. So, the fact that these two, two anti-correlations are observed means that we are observing material that have been, uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, burnt through the CNO cycle, so production of, uh, hydrogen from, uh, of helium from hydrogen through the CNO cycle, at temperature of the order of uh, 70 to 100 million Kelvin, very high temperature. This is a temperature which is absolutely not possible in many superstars. The superstars of the uh, of old many superstars, like the one that are observed in globular cluster. These stars uh, at maximum reach a temperature of about 10 to 20 million Kelvin. So, uh, to, for a long time it was thought that this. Uh, uh, strange abundances were limited to the giant branch stars and it was due to some uh, strange mixing along the, the giant branch evolution of small stars. Uh, this uh, idea uh, should, can be checked quite easily. Uh, theory of stellar evolution predicts a first mixing episode at the base of the giant branch due to the inward penetration of the outer convective envelope in regions where, during the event sequence, there was previous hydrogen burning. But uh, the hydrogen burning that uh, we are thinking, thinking now is of low temperature, is of the order of 5 to 10 million Kelvin. So in that case, you can only have an incomplete CN, CN cycle, not enough, for the temperature is not enough to, to, uh, for the Coulomb barrier that we have on the oxygen, so you can okay, not uh, complete the CNO cycle, it's only in incomplete ones, and uh, so you it can only affect the abundances of carbon and nitrogen, but not the abundances of oxygen. This uh, episode was discovered in 1964 by Ekoiben, is called the first rejab. But the first rejab causes only minor effects in, in metaplastars, some variation of carbon, some variation of nitrogen, not very large, by the way. It also produces an illusion of the outer convective envelope in, in, uh, uh, so that the uh, outer convective envelope expands a lot. So the lithium, which was saved at the surface of the star, uh, lithium is easily destroyed in the interior of the star. Uh, a few million Kelvin is enough to destroy lithium. So lithium is missing from the central part of the star, it's only in the surface. And when you have this uh, penetration of the convective envelope in the world, uh, you uh, um, dilute the lithium abundance, the lithium which is there, into the whole outer convective envelope. The result is that the abundance of lithium drops. So the prediction is that you have uh, the, the main sequence start, and you have the first ray jump, you have a second part of the lower jump, the giant branch, where you see the effect of the first ray jump and the dilution of lithium. Then uh, there is another possibility of mixing, which happens only in the upper part of the giant branch, because uh, this happens because in this part of the lower energy branch there is a strong uh, uh, entropy barrier uh, due to the variation in composition that is left by the, the penetration of the convection here uh, that prevents further mixing of the outer part with the inner part of the stars. But uh, when the, uh, outer, the, the um, hydrogen burning shell shifts outward because it's burning hydrogen, burning hydrogen into helium and uh, the consequently it has to, to move upward to find a hydrogen, to find some, uh, uh, some fuel for the hydrogen body. And at some point this uh, shell meets this discontinuity. When it meets this discontinuity, there is a stop in the star formation because there is a mixing of the outer part with the inner part, there is some additional fuel for the body, the star stops there for some time and then continues its evolution. And when you have this uh, mixing, you can uh, when you um, have this, you can sell the, this uh, entropy barrier and you have may have the mixing in this phase. But this, uh, this can happen only in very bright stars. In that, that case, you may have some deeper mixing. And uh, uh, this uh, 
it was thought that uh, in, this, in this phase you could have some uh, variation of the, of the sodium and oxygen abundances. But actually, this is not the case. Uh, this was a paper that we made uh, 20 years ago about trying to understand, to confirm or not this uh, paradigm. And what you find is that, uh, okay, this is the first jump here. These are the basic stars that have uh, high lithium, high carbon, and uh, relatively low nitrogen is plotted here. And then you have this uh, faster jump, lithium drops because of the dilution, there is a small change in carbon, not very large. Uh, nothing happens for oxygen, nothing happens for sodium. And then you have uh, the, bright, the second jump uh, for the bright, when you have this. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, episode of uh, uh, further missing, which happens uh, this, uh, this part is, uh, is called the LGB band because in the luminosity function there is a bump and more stars there than brighter and fainter. And this is because of the, of the uh, uh, additional fuel that we have at this that moment that allows the star to live more in that phase. Okay, and so it's called the LGB band. Okay, in that phase you have a drop in the which uh, almost disappeared from the surface. You have a drop in carbon. Uh, you have a change in carbon 30 to carbon 13 ratio, which drops. But you do not change sodium and then oxygen. Oxygen and sodium are uh, needs too high temperature, and this mixing that you have there do not go inward enough to temperatures high enough that you have a uh, burning of uh, oxygen and uh, production of sodium. So, the result is that uh, for field stars, there is nothing here. Uh, no no anti sodium and oxygen anti uh, All the stars, independent of their evolutionary phase, have the same uh, abundances of oxygen and sodium. So, when more or less at the same time, uh, and the UVS spectrograph was completed on the uh, VLT telescope, and it became possible to make observa similar observations for stars in the cluster, going down to stars in the, uh, to, um, the, the main sequence of the global cluster, not simply to observe the red giants or how uh, it was done before. So we did this problem, and we selected uh, different groups of stars in clusters that were already well analyzed from the red giant range, but were not analyzed that well for the lower part of the diagram. So we selected a group of stars near the turn off here, the end of the main sequence, and at the base of the Sutrayan branch. These are stars that are well below the Regiant branch band, where we may have this mix, deep mixing episode. So we expect these stars to have essentially the same uh, chemical composition, original chemical composition, that, uh, uh, especially this is true for the turn off stars. Uh, between, in between these and these, there is the first jump. Okay, what we found is that the oxygen sodium decoration is present also for the stars that are on the main sequence or uh, on the subgiant range. Uh, exactly as it is observed in the red giants. Uh, the, this shows that this is in things is in print from the original composition of the star. It's not something that uh, uh, happened due to the chemical evolution, the, the mixing of the surface of the star during its evolution. It's something which was original for the stars. The stars already, when they born, already they had a very different composition. And uh, this means that today they belong to different populations, because you have stars that have a composition which is very similar to the field stars, and we may see, think them they are the original stars, but we have stars which have very different composition. And you must uh, have material, the, the star form must form from material, which have an experience in this high temperature, 100 million Kelvin, and hydrogen power with this temperature. And this should happen, could happen only within other stars of, uh, of, the, of the same cluster. So the idea is that there are multiple uh, generations of stars in the cluster. There is a first generation, which is possibly have the composition similar to three stars, but there is another generation, at least one, maybe more, that have uh, the format from material that has been processed in the interior of other stars, 
of the stars which were uh, already in the cluster, but they um, have a hydro composition, uh, uh, another technical composition. Uh, we also found that uh, uh, it's not enough to transform carbon in nitrogen to justify the oscillations, that is too much nitrogen. And what you can uh, obtain, and you, you can uh, you can explain the data if you assume that essentially all oxygen, almost all oxygen, is transformed into nitrogen. It's essentially uh, as you expect for a complete CNO cycle. So, the conclusion of that large program was that uh, the oxygen sodium anticorrelation is present among the two North Stars, and two giants, and uh, we observed also the magnesium aluminum anticorrelation in these stars. In the, in these stars. Uh, this clearly rules out the mixing as an explanation for the oxygen sodium anticorrelation. And the sum of CA plus N plus O is, uh, seems to be constant. And the fraction of the stars in globular cluster, this means that the fraction of stars in globular cluster, the second generation stars, formed from the data of the media population. Okay, this is uh, a few cases, but then we wanted to study a large sample clusters and the large number of stars in each cluster. This was possible when the flames became available at 20. This was in 2004. And we then started a program to systematically observe a large number of clusters and the large population of stars in each one of them. Uh, to study, to understand better this, uh, what, what was happening with the sodium oxygen anticorrelation. And uh, these are uh, the cluster of the original paper, then we have added a few other now. And what we found is that uh, the oxygen sodium anticorrelation, oxygen versus sodium, is a widespread phenomenon in globular cluster. Actually, all the globular clusters that we observe have an anticorrelation between the oxygen and sodium. It's not something that you find one solution in your two. It's all the cluster, globular cluster, have an oxygen sodium anticorrelation. And uh, uh, if we plot here the, essentially the luminosity of the global cluster, again a parameter which is representing of the age, but doesn't matter very much what is the CISA here, essentially what is the ordinator here. What we found is that uh, the red point marks the cluster where we, it was found that there is a certain mass positive anticorrelation, not only from our work. And uh, the open symbols, the open, the, these symbols with a uh, Cross are the cluster where it was not observed an oxygen sodium anticorrelation. It was the cluster were observed, but there was no, uh, it was not found an oxygen sodium anticorrelation. And uh, what is evident from this figure is that there is a segregation of the objects in luminosity. And luminosity means mass. The most massive objects are those in which you find the sodium oxygen anticorrelation. The less massive object you do not find. These objects are typically called open clusters. These objects are typically called global clusters. So while uh, the definition of global cluster is quite loose in, uh, in uh, uh, astronomy, uh, we, we propose that essentially global clusters are those objects that show the oxygen sodium anticorrelation, which means they show multiple spectral population. While the open clusters are the objects that do not show it. And essentially, this means that they are single stellar population. So the, division, the distinction between the, uh, open cluster and global cluster is not simply a matter of one is bigger, the other one is smaller, but is that one has a very different history from the other. One is about uh, the star you, you, you have uh, an episode of star formation before the object. The other one is much more complicated. You have different episodes of star formation, and the global cluster is the end product of a complex history that at the end products of the cluster, produce a global cluster. Okay, the sodium anticorrelation is, as I told you, is present in all cluster, but it is not the same in all cluster. There are differences in how it is made, the oxygen sodium anticorrelation. There are clusters in which there is a lot of variation of sodium, only a small variation in oxygen. There are other clusters in which both sodium and oxygen changes a lot. There is a irregularities in these changes. And uh, we may uh, uh, found that these irregularities are correlated with basic properties of the globular cluster. For instance, if we define the interquartile of the distribution of oxygen of 
rassodio, essentially a vision of how it is extended the range of values of oxygen of rassodio in the cluster. We found that this correlates quite well with the absolute levity of the cluster, with the total mass of the cluster. The, the more massive it is a cluster, the longest is the oxygen sodium anticorrelation. That is, the more different are the stars one from the others. And uh, there is a, by the way, the most massive cluster also show a variation in iron abundances, not only in oxygen and sodium. This means a much more complex history with uh, supernova and so on, contributing to chemical composition. But this is only limited to the very, very large clusters. There are essentially three or four clusters in our galaxy that clearly show a variation in iron abundance. Most of the lower clusters, of the 150, do not show variations in iron abundance. And in some cases, the limits are very low. Uh, this is the observation of limit, the RMS, but uh, the real limit is much lower because there is there are the observation of errors that also contribute to the scattering. So if you consider the observation of error, many of these points are compatible with zero. No variation in iron, but a lot of variation in, uh, in sodium and oxygen. Uh, there are peculiar cases like uh, omega 7. Omega 7 is the largest globular cluster in the Milky Way. It has a very complex global uh, region iron with multiple region iron branches. And uh, also there are uh, uh, these multiple region iron branches may be interpreted as different, different uh, population which differs in metallicity within this cluster. Uh, metallicity means iron. And in that case, the variation of iron is uh, over a factor of 10, approximately. So it's a very large variation from star to star. Uh, but uh, there is not only a variation in uh, uh, iron, each one of these populations has also has own, its own different sodium oxygen anticorrelation. In some cases, it's not a correl anticorrelation. In the most metal rich population, there is a positive correlation between sodium and oxygen. <coughs> While the meta poor one, there is uh, an anticorrelation. So it's a very strange case, very complex, and uh, uh, okay, it's not very easy to explain everything here. Uh, but what is very peculiar in the case of uh, omega 7 is that uh, the main sequence is split. In some way, this is obvious because you should expect that if uh, there are uh, populations with different metallicity, the meta poor population should be bluer and the meta rich population should be redder. But the only problem is that in omega cell this does not happen in this way. The blue and main sequence is not the most uh, meta poor, it's the most meta rich. And the, the red sequence is not the most meta rich, it's most, the most meta poor. So it's the two are exchanged. And uh, this fact is uh, very odd. And there is only one possible explanation for this uh, odd fact, and that is that there is a huge variation in native abundance between the two populations. The blue population is much more helium rich than the other one. And the helium abundance that you needed to explain this population here has never been found in any other population in, the, in our galaxy. There is no other population that has a helium as high as this one. The helium is about 0.4, uh, while most of the stars in our galaxy are between 0.4 and 0.3 in this range. So this is a very strange composition that is found in globular cluster stars, at least in some of the globular cluster stars. So this also calls for a very peculiar chemical evolution history. It's only a group of, particular group of stars that are important here, which is the typical chemical evolution of the galaxy I have a little weight, not too much. And they are, you see the, 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 the effect is uh, overwhelmed by other stars that are very different uh, kind of nucleosynthesis and when you make the chemical history of the galaxy, you don't find these objects. You find there, in these uh, segregated environments, the globular clusters. Uh, omega 7 is not the only case in which you find similar things. One other case is NGC 2808, again multiple main sequence. In this case, the chemical composition, the iron abundance is the same for the three groups. There is no variation in iron abundance in this cluster. But uh, the, the list still three main sequence different. And again, you must uh, look for difference in helium to explain these different sequences. Uh, another fact that was uh, soon discovered is that there is a clear correlation between uh, the oxygen sodium anticorrelation and the extension of the horizontal branch. 
I told at the beginning that the horizontal branch of the globular cluster extended. This was not really well understood. There was, uh, for a lot of time, there was a discussion about what is the mechanism that caused this extension. Uh, this was called the so-called second parameter effect. Actually, the second parameter effect is even more complex because uh, there is also an effect of from one cluster to another. But okay, this is a big part of the, of the second parameter effect. And what was discovered is that uh, the oxygen sodium extension of the oxygen sodium quality correlation is also closely related to the, high, the largest temperature that you can get for stars in the main sequence. The stars that have very uh, uh, high uh, temperature uh, should be related in some way to stars which have a very anomalous oxygen to sodium sodium ratios. Uh, in effect, uh, really, uh, this was, uh, there was a proposition to explain this, which was made by Frank Arantona, uh, up in the paper in 2002, but this plots it from a data paper in 2005. And essentially, the idea is that uh, the sodium anticorrelation is related to heating, because uh, the, essentially, the stars which uh, uh, produce the sodium bound the oxygen also produce heat. This is expected essentially because the, the, the possible target, the possible candidates for, uh, for this uh, production are in deep stars that produce a lot of helium, like the uh, mass energy stars or the uh, or, or fast rotating massive stars. So this, uh, this correlation between helium and the sodium oxygen anticorrelation should be expected. But helium means also position of the stars on the horizontal range. Why? Because helium stars should evolve faster than the others. And so, uh, if they have the same mass loss, you must find that the evolved range stars, like the horizontal range stars, should be less massive than the uh, stars which uh, uh, normal even. And so, since they are less massive, they should be fewer when they, they are on the horizontal range. So there should be a correlation, um, not necessarily exactly one to one, but uh, a clear correlation, between the abundances of sodium and oxygen and the helium abundance, and then the position the star will occupy on the horizontal range. This is, uh, uh, has been explored in several ways, and uh, it's one of the big success of this, success of this uh, 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 scenario. Uh, well, we now are uh, Foreseeing a formation scenario for the global class, how you can produce all these things, all this uh, phenomenology. Well, the idea is that the global class form, uh, well, possibly from an iteration between some um, fragment, which was still gaseous, and the Milky Way. Uh, this led uh, to first the formation of a precursor population, which triggered fast and star formation, but essentially, at the end, what we have is a large primordial population. This uh, large population of primordial population of stars uh, has uh, its massive stars, which evolve. Winds from these massive stars and core collapse the globe stop further formation and clean the region from primordial interstellar medium. Then what we have is that the low velocity wind from massive AGV stars generate a cooling flow. And the second generation starts from forming this cooling flow. The, also, this star formation is stopped by the core collapse of in the meantime, there should be some recounting between that matter and gas. And what we have in the, what we have in the end is a, a global cluster. Uh, there are various confirmations of this scenario, but most of the one simple thing is that the global clusters are much more concentrated than the gross order, which are all just at likely above in isolation. Uh, okay, I will skip this because I'm not seeing it. But okay, this scenario made a clear connection between the halo and the globular cluster, how the cluster, the halo form and the globular cluster form. Uh, okay, the major core part of the halo uh, may be made of objects like the smallest most object, but uh, the bulk of the halo is much more greater, rich, and uh, is clearly different from the stars or stars of similar metallicity, which have a very different chemical composition. So the most of the halo cannot be done in this way. There should be another mechanism to do the most of the head of our galaxy. We propose that uh, 
Fred generation population of Romania class, and I'm a class member candidate. Why? Well, uh, we know that uh, the, there is a mechanism, there are various mechanisms with which you may lose stars from Romania class. The first mechanism is very fast, I can see the very early phases, related to the viral relaxation that you have following gas expansion and gas loss from the most massive stars. On the longer time scale, you have evaporation from the cluster or stars in the cluster due to the body encounters and other mechanic disk shocking and so on. Okay, the second effect extracts uh, some percent of the star in the relaxation time, which is of the order 10 to the 8 to the 9 year for a longer cluster. Uh, this first mechanism, however, may produce much more stars in the uh, lost and longer cluster. A substantial fraction of the original globular cluster mass should have been lost, and you expect that this loss is more efficient among the smaller clusters. Uh, the, in particular, of the second mechanism, there are a lot of evidence that is real. Uh, there are tidal tails around the globular cluster, the efficiency of small mass stars, which are preferentially lost if there is any partition. So it's clear that the globular clusters are the survivors of a potential initial, initial larger potential. But this does not mean itself that the uh, bloody field stars were formed in globular cluster. Uh, but we may try to make some uh, numbers out of the multiple stellar generation scenario. Uh, okay, the stellar generation population is typical of globular cluster. This has been shown now clearly. The fraction of stars that are sodium rich or CN rich in the field data is of the order of 2.5%, much smaller than the typical value of 60% that you find in the cluster. So, what we may think is that uh, since stars evaporate from longer clusters, we may think that this 2.5% represents stars that form a longer cluster but uh, are then evaporated and are now in the air. It's a small, very small fraction of the air. Okay, uh, what we may, we may have then is that the scenario of stellar population, first generation stars with typical composition of the J type of polar supernova and similar to the few stars, are only about one third of the current total population of the planet cluster. To reproduce the number of uh, first generation and second generation stars, you, we need a large fraction of stars so the first generation must have been lost. This came from many reasons. Once you use the to make, uh, make a simulation of dynamic evolution, but there is a basic reason. The only a small part of the stars uh, give the peculiar chemical uh, uh, signature that we see in global cluster. Uh, so only a small part of these uh, first generation stars are used to form the second generation stars. And for this reason, you must think that in origin there should be much more first generation star than second generation star. But now, second generation star dominate. And so this means that there should be much many more stars in globular clusters in the beginning. Uh, okay, currently the, we may count the present mass of globular cluster and compare it to the mass of the area. Uh, we may do some assumptions which are very simple. And we might end up with mass of globular cluster of the order of something 10 to the 6, where the mass of the area in the same region which is from the order of 10 to the 8. So the current mass of the cluster is about 1% of the mass of the area. Uh, the original mass of the cluster should have been larger. Uh, two thirds of the stars now are second generation. Uh, stars from a composition similar to, to the second generation are 2 to 5% of the current of the stars. If these are second generation stars lost by the cluster, then and the second generation stars are lost by the global cluster the same rate as first generation one, with some 2.5% to 1.2%. The star lost by the global cluster after the formation of the second generation is 3%, but before now, uh, is 3.7% of the current Taylor stars. Okay, they were not mass, they had about 4% of the star on the mass of the of the at the beginning. Okay, still a small mass, a small part on the top. But, uh, okay, uh, currently 
1.2% like in this, in this way we arrive to, to these values of the order of 5% of the error which are in the Gobra class because currently 1.2% of the error is in the Gobra class they should have lost 75% of the original mass they were originally 4 times more mass than 9 and so we arrive to 5% of the error where in the Gobra class but this is not the total mass in the Gobra class involved in the formation of the Gobra class it is the mass of the globular cluster after the formation of the second generation stars. The, the cluster at that epoch had 5% of the total. But we need that uh, the cluster were much more massive in the beginning. Uh, because else we are not material enough to produce the second generation stars that we have now. There should have been 10 times more massive, something like that. And uh, if we multiply this 5% by 10, we arrive to 50%. And so the, the concept is that the bulk of second generation stars from the formula from the ejector of all the um, sorry, I said this. Uh, so the concept is the end the a large part of the mass of the error should have been in the first generation of the global clusters. They are they are not in the global cluster now, they are not like the global cluster stars that we observe now, they are like the first generation stars of the global clusters. And uh, if this is true, most of the galactic data, if not all, might be made of the first generation of global clusters. That means that the formation of global clusters happened in the same episodes that formed the, the most of the data of our galaxy. The global cluster production was an end product, a small zone of a much larger episode, and this episode was connected to the bulk of the formation of the galactic data. And by extension, by formation of the populations, of all populations that have a number of global clusters per, per unit mass similar to the area of our galaxy. For instance, the, the giant elliptical galaxies that are dominated by a population which is very rich in global clusters. Okay, there are many tests, I will not enter into this, but up to now the test has been essentially possible. That is, we may test the density distribution, the density distribution, the chemistry, the luminosity function of the horizontal red stars. All of them con, uh, are passive in this sense. The, the, uh, conf, does not, uh, uh, are not against these hypotheses. Uh, if this is true, we may use the age metallicity relation for global cluster to interpret the age metallicity relation for global galaxies. And we may try to understand how the our galaxy formed. Uh, so the conclusions of my talk is that all global clusters are not single stellar population. They are made of multiple stellar population. This multiple stellar population explains many peculiarities of global cluster. For instance, the second parameter, many others, for instance, the functional binaries. The multiple population indicate a complex but characteristic formation scenario driven by the total mass. And the global cluster of first generation might have formed the galactic kingdom. Sodium and uh, poor in oxygen, but uh, those which are so rich in helium to 
be important in this uh, respect are very few. So I would say that there is some something to be taken care of, but I don't think we can change completely the scenario. Do you think that the young massive clusters that you observe in the Magellanic cloud, for example, could be a problem in terms of classical global clusters? Well, uh, there is a lot of puzzling observations concerning these clusters. Uh, they are typically not very massive. So if we compare them with the globular clusters, they are the much lower mass. And so it is not clear from this point of view that we are comparing this, really the same kind of object. Uh, many clusters in the Magellanic clouds show evidence of multiple populations. But what it is not clear is that there is a spread in the chemical composition uh, between uh, uh, the these different populations. That is, you may also think of multiple populations if you have uh, association, which you form different clusters, one after the other, but uh, not uh, strictly related one to the other. And uh, these are different ages. You merge together, you have a population which have different ages. Okay? So it makes it looks like a multiple population from the age point of view, but uh, it is not obvious that uh, it's a second generation. That is, that one population is formed from the ejecta, the stars from the other, from the older population which is what we are saying in our cluster. So, in this moment I would say that uh, the evidence is not clear, but I would say that there are probably not enough mass to be really analog analogs to the global cluster. So, I mean, they lose gas very quickly. So, Sorry? Uh, these massive, young massive clusters lose their gas very quickly. Maybe so that they are simply not enough mass. The, this episode is, uh, this me mechanism is probably limited to the cluster which originally started with uh, 10 to the 6 or even more solar masses. The clusters in the Magellanic clouds are typically 10 to the 4 solar masses. Thank you. Okay. Further questions from the students and postdocs? So you mentioned a formation scenario in which the global clusters and the Bulls-Royals form similar objects. Now, the global clusters are not So should we be expecting to see that matter to them, globular clusters? Well, uh, first thing is, is not being observed. The second thing is that the uh, globular clusters are tidally limited objects. That is, uh, the stars occupy the space they have at their disposal. All the, all the room, all the space, the volume of space that they have is occupied by stars. This is not the case of uh, worst periods. Uh, the asteroids, uh, the stars are only occupying only a small part of the of the Roche lobe. If you think in uh, tidal wave of our galaxy, they, uh, so they are not tidal limited. Uh, and uh, it's not clear that uh, the universe should you can observe any dark matter in the cluster because if the dark matter profile is very shallow, very wide, then it's not clear that the clusters are not tidal limited. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 We see in a globular cluster there seem, may be simply so much small amount of, uh, of dark matter that you cannot measure it. Okay, so let's uh, open the rounds to everybody. Can you can please go back to your summary? Can you go back to your summary in the slide? So before asking my question, I want to make a small remark. It's fine there. Yeah. Um, you should actualize your bottom line yeah, that you are talking here and not in the other. Otherwise, you feel like second, second. <laughs> <laughs> but another question of the helium. Uh, is there any direct observation of the higher helium content of, 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 of the stars? Uh, or if not, is there any hope to get it? Uh, there are some measures of helium abundance in stars in global clusters. They are very difficult because. Uh, uh, there are a number of problems in the lighting medium of global cluster. Most of the stars are too cool to have uh, strong helium features. There are uh, helium, helium has been derived for a few stars from the chromospheric lines of uh, uh, helium 1 at 1080 is a work by Taspini, another at home, and another one by 
to breed at all. And, uh, but, uh, okay, you may have some doubts about it because it's very difficult to derive abundances from chromos figures. In this case, in the case of uh, uh, the Pasquini et al. paper, they try to make a model of the chromos sphere, they to normalize to the calcium 2 lines and so on. And uh, they think that there is some evidence of spread, direct spread of illegal abundance. The other stars that can be observed for illegal are of the horizontal range stars because these are warmer. And so, they, in principle, are warm enough that you can see the new lines. The problem is that uh, stars warmer than about uh, 11,000 Kelvin have uh, um, are the, the outer part of the atmosphere is in relative equilibrium. Helium uh, drops from the atmosphere, you don't see any more the helium. You also essentially, essentially see the, uh, the, the effect of sedimentation and radiative uh, levitation of the elements. So, the balances are not meaningful. So in the end, you can observe all these stars between 10,000 and 8,000 Kelvin to, to make this. And in this case, uh, the stars that you expect to be there are not the extremely you rich. You observe helium uh, B, which is uh, slightly above the value that, uh, because the logic is not very much more. But you do not expect to observe there the helium rich stars. Uh, for the most very hot helium rich, uh, for the uh, hot uh, helium stars, there are works by uh, Sabine Weber and uh, collaborators. Uh, they found some evidence for uh, large helium, but uh, the error star I think are very large. I don't think it's uh, by itself convincing. It's uh, more or less a confirmation of what we expect to find. Um, one obvious uh, consequence of your scenario is that the vast majority of the halo field stars should not have this oxygen depletion. Yes. Has this been checked? Yes. And? And um, do not have. Okay. So <laughs> that's one of the tests that you Yes, have but made. I have missed out the decision from there. That's <laughs> one of the basic uh, data. Yeah. Yeah. So, just coming back to, to, to the question about the title, uh, title. The question between global process or short. But the title limit of global process, isn't it also partially circular? Is this based on that actually they shouldn't have slow slides? Determine where the title is. Oh, well, the idea that they, they are tidally limited is because they are very light, mass profile, light profile, and so on, are very well reproduced by King models that are tidally limited. This is the reason we think they are tidally limited. Because if you look at the prof light profile and interpret them in terms of mass profile, they are very well reproduced by tidally limited models. Yeah, but that doesn't prove yet that that's not a No. But uh, cannot be more than a given amount because the mass light ratio is, uh, is quite low. Is, uh, typically, is on the order of two or less than two. So, I, so it's uh, if you say that there is a ten percent of the stars, the mass in dark matter is ten percent of the mass of the star. You cannot say there isn't. But you can exclude uh, that there is more dark matter than mass in the stars. So the upper limit, you can get an upper limit. So, so just ask, maybe in the, in the if question, but I mean, you say, what is the argument based on that uh, for, for the second generation, which is now the dominant in number, uh, you need uh, um, originally a larger, and we'll talk about the second time, um, uh, first generation population. Yes. So, the argument so is that. Anyway, what is, well, because I understand they are ejected from the first generation. Yes. So how are you going to determine how many you need? Okay. The ejector from the first generation, the, the first generation, only a part of the stars of the first generation, uh, have had the right mass to produce this chemical power composition pattern. Okay. They should not be very massive because else they will explode the supernova and they should produce a very large, huge variation in the uh, uh, iron peak elements. In, uh, so this is not observed in most of the black cluster. So these are not the right uh, stars. Then you must exclude the uh, small mass stars because the small mass stars produce a lot of carbon and uh, we do not observe this carbon. And yet we end up with a range of mass which includes some 10% uh, of the mass. Of course you, you can call for a very peculiar mass function which is peaked exactly at the mass that you need 
meter to produce the right uh, composition. It's a very strange uh, assumption. The real problem is also there because uh, this kind of object produces a lot of remnants. And these remnants, uh, if you have too many remnants, you cannot uh, have the dynamics that you see in your craft. You do not, do not have the light must make recipe, which is well produced by the assumption that remnants are not very much, very many in your craft. So at the end, it's, it's very difficult to, to tune uh, in mass function, is certainly such that you do not need a lot of. Of first generation stars. It's almost compulsory. There is no way to avoid it. Okay, so can, um, I would like to wrap up now and defer any further questions to the dinner. <laughs>